All right. Well, good morning and welcome to Conversations on Retail. My name is Matt Pfeiffer, and we are so excited today to continue Brand Overson series on asset protection and risk management. Today, Brand's guest is Jerry Geisler, the SVP and Chief Information Security Officer for Walmart. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues. First of all, this and every other series is presented by Westrock Coffee Company. With offices in 10 countries, the company sources coffee and tea from 35 origin countries. And for more information, you can visit westrockcoffee.com. This group's also sponsored by our friends at Barcoding, at Rapitag, at Occucon, and Everseen. Special thanks to those sponsors. Today's featured sponsor is Barcoding, a supply chain automation and innovation company that helps organizations be more efficient, accurate, and connected. If you'd like to start a conversation, reach out to JW Franz. You can see his email address there. Brand has actually been conducting this series now for several months. And uh, if you've missed any of his conversations, you can go to our YouTube channel, which you see the address there, and check out his conversations with each of those past guests. Lastly, just a reminder that this is a conversation and not a presentation. And we would love for you to actively participate. If you've got questions, uh, to ask or insights to offer, simply click on that Q&A button in Zoom and submit those in writing. And if we've got time at the end, we will stop recording and we will uh, allow folks to click the raise hand button and participate in some open discussion. So without further ado, Brand, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Matt. And welcome, Jerry. Um, as Matt said, guys, we've been really looking forward to getting Jerry uh, live. Um one thing I always appreciate appreciated about Jerry, and I've known you do what twenty five years or so, is uh, Jerry is one of the few executives that has not forgotten where he came from and what his roots are. He's been uh, profoundly successful at the world's biggest retailer, and I'm really flattered to have him on, Jerry. I guess it's an accurate statement to say you run the biggest uh, information security whatever the proper term is on the planet, aside from federal, right? And in, in private sector, is that an accurate statement? Uh, no, there are definitely programs out there that are, are bigger. Um, but we, of course, size ourselves to scale to meet you know, Walmart's needs. Yeah. Okay. And one, one other note I'll add, Matt, is that for all the listeners out here, um, the, obviously, Jerry's in a sensitive position, so we are safeguarding. We're not going to answer questions specific to how does Walmart do X. Um, if Jerry elects to answer the question, that's his prerogative, but we want to be mindful and respectful of his position and the sensitivity of the position he holds. Um, Jerry, I want to give you as much time as you want, dude, to walk through kind of the ladder that you followed, not only what you do now, but more importantly, when our paths crossed back, I guess it was the late 90s and what was then called loss prevention and kind of how your career path is uh, taken course before we jump into some of the bigger questions. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. And thanks for having me. And, and thanks for that kind and generous introduction. Um, in terms of my career, of course, today I'm fortunate to serve um, as the senior vice president, chief information security officer for for Walmart and all of our our global brands, it's truly probably been uh, the greatest privilege of my career to be able to serve in this role. And as you uh, alluded to, my path to this role was a atypical. Um, in fact, I, I just hit my thirty second anniversary with Walmart, so I've been here a long time. Um, I started in my local store right out of high school. Um, and Brand, I think you know this. Uh, shortly thereafter, I joined the Marine Corps when I came off of active duty. Um, I went back to that local store. Same personnel manager was there. Was able to get my job back. You know, went back to college. Um, you know, never intending for Walmart to necessarily be a career. At that time, I, you know, it was a job while I was going to college. And um, I, I, Ended up uh, entering a degree program where I had some classes in the daytime and some at night. Uh, so I looked around and thought, you know, where can I move to actually just make my own schedule? And that was loss prevention. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I migrated to loss prevention 
and uh, was actually very close to uh, moving into a law enforcement career. And um, just before I was going to leave the company, uh, my supervisor at the time was getting promoted into the home office and came and said, I think you ought to interview for my role. And I thought, well, heck, why not? You know, it, if nothing else, I'll get the experience of interviewing. Um, you know, I had never interviewed for a role like that. I was, you know, much younger, obviously. Yeah. And um, and I did. I, I went through a series of interviews and was offered the role. And, and uh, I think it was maybe, you know, my next to last day or last day with the company when I got a call and was offered the role. And that was the day that uh, the job became a career. And I've been fortunate throughout my career um, to be presented with opportunities to, to grow um, and develop into to new spaces. As you, as you mentioned, um, you and I met, I think after I had come to the home office and I came out of the field, I yeah. spent 10 years in the stores at market level as part of market teams, which was great. Um, you know, and I still keep that centrally focused because that's why we're all here, regardless of our, our role that we serve in. Um, when I came to the corporate office, there were new opportunities that presented themselves. And of course, being in the traditional security space and kind of being a, a geek, um, I started taking an interest in um, file system forensics, which was really in its infancy at the time. But I started to see the intersection points with what I was doing at that time in the more traditional security space and file system forensics. So I started. I started learning and uh, working with our IT teams, and eventually Walmart started a forensics team, and um, and I campaigned to to actually move to that team. I wasn't perfectly qualified for the role, um, but I guess I was ambitious enough and 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 eager enough to learn um, that I uh, and had learned enough that I was able to get through the tech check, which we did at the time, and was offered a role. And a lot of people don't know this, but because I. I wasn't perfectly qualified. I was offered the role, but I had to take a demotion um, to move into the role, which of course was a decision point in a career when sure. you have an opportunity to go a different direction, but you know, there, there's a trade-off and uh, ultimately um, you know, I took that trade-off and, uh, and have since, you know, just been afforded a number of opportunities to continue to grow and develop. I had a mentor, um, you know, at one time who told me very plainly that, listen, none of us get there on our own and we have to have people take an interest in our careers. And I've certainly have had a number of people throughout my career that have taken an interest and advocated for me and championed me um, that really has helped me, you know, to move into to more and more senior roles. And certainly I see that as part of my remit now is to do the same thing for people that are earlier in their career to develop that next generation of security practitioner and security leader. Yeah, you, it, it certainly shows in the way you lead, Jerry. Um, and like I said, we've known each other 25 years. And I think the first time I met you, you were interviewing for what was then called corporate fraud. That's probably right. Yeah. And Richard Wells and I and other people were on the panel. Um, and, you know, you talked about something uh, that, that matters, the, the demotion you took to take the risk, the professional risk. You know, I went through something similar when I left active duty. I was a captain, field artillery, had, you know, had time uh, in Fort Sill and came back from Germany. And I was a senior officer instructor at Fort Sill, Oklahoma in the gunnery department and <clears throat> talked to then Keith Obley, who called when I decided to get out. I went and got my MBA uh, because I thought, you know, an 11 year old undergrad degree in criminal justice is probably not going to be the hottest thing on the market. So I put forth the time and effort, went to get an MBA to make myself more marketable and got the call from Keith. And at, at the time, uh, it was called loss prevention. And he got me on the phone. And I remember first couple of words out of his mouth, he was talking about <clears throat> security. And in my mind, I almost hung up on it. We laugh about it today, but I'm like, dude, seriously, I haven't come this far to, to go back to what I envisioned as a mall cop. Um, but he said, don't hang up. I was in the Air Force. Let me translate what this means. And the rest is history. Obviously, I, I made the jump. But to your point about the demotion, 
Uh, it was a significant financial reduction for me to come to Walmart back in the, the mid 90s. Walmart compensation packages weren't nearly as attractive as they are now for people coming into the workforce. So it was a risk, but turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, anyway, uh, so let's kind of transition, Jerry, for because we will come back and visit professional development because of your career path and uh, people you've hired and given that chance to, as you um, eloquently stated, we've all been given chances. I mean, if you think you haven't, then you've got to check your ego. Somebody has always extended us an opportunity, and God knows I did, both active duty when I sometimes didn't deserve it. I was given an opportunity and somehow stumbled into success. And the same thing at Walmart. Had some great leaders at Walmart uh, helping us along and, you know, of course, helping build out that sense of perspective. Had some leaders that uh, luckily I only worked for briefly. So let's talk about, in your view, and keeping to our promise at the beginning of the broadcast to not probe anything Walmart specific. What do you see, Jerry, as the biggest cyber and tech challenge for private sector, unless it blends over into public sector being government and stuff like that? But let's kind of stay in the private sector wheelhouse. What do you see as the single biggest challenge? What is I hate the overused phrase, what keeps you up at night, but what gives you heartburn? Yeah, the, you know, the the challenges um, probably aren't all that different between public and private. You know, we're all dealing with very similar things in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think probably the most frequently spoken about challenge in the information security or cybersecurity industry is is the shortage of talent. And um, that, you know, that is something that everybody has to be focused on, not, not only um, bringing people into the field uh, of cybersecurity, um, but then keeping people in the field of cybersecurity. So, you know, giving people a career path growing them, developing, uh, the talent, um, you know, like, like law enforcement, um, technology has often been, you know, male dominated, um, and cybersecurity, uh, it, it is a niche within that and, and certainly has, has had, you know, similar, um, similar workforce challenges in yeah. terms of diversity and representation. Um, you know, so one of the things that, that we've done um, here, and I see a lot of other organizations doing that, is trying to increase the representation in the cybersecurity field. And sometimes that starts very early. You know, we're, we're out talking sometimes to middle school kids, certainly high school kids, to talk about these career paths, um, you know, and engage, and engage early and often. Um, to show people that, that, you know, there is a path for everybody to get into this industry if they're interested in getting into this industry. Um, because, you know, there, there were whole segments of the population that weren't very well represented, uh, specifically women, women and minorities. Um, so I, I think the lean in, certainly from my own organization and, and many others, is helping to start to close that, that workforce shortage gap. Um, so that's the first challenge I would call out. I think the, I think the other challenge that, that is common across all security programs or security practitioners is the risk of erosion of trust. You know, no, no matter what organization you work for, you're trying to mitigate risk, however it may represent itself. It's not always, you know, bad guys. There's a lot of ways that risk presents itself in technology. So we're always trying to minimize those risks wherever they may present themselves. And, you know, if you fail to minimize the right risks or manage the right risks um, and you have issues or incidents where you don't adequately protect data, then ultimately, among other things, or I should say maybe minimally what that's likely to lead to is an erosion of trust of your stakeholders, whoever that might be, whether it's customers, consumers, or, or just citizens. Um, so there's always a focus around what are the things that are going to, to be harmful from a brand and reputation perspective that just undermines ultimately the trust that we're trying to provide and create? Yeah, it's interesting the order 
you mentioned that um, that I, I was expecting the inverse you to to give me the technology answer first, but that really is again a reflection of where your head is on talent in trying to get the industry in a better position. Um, you know, years ago, uh, we were given a presentation. You might have been in the auditorium. It was either at uh, one of the big annual meetings. And um, this speaks to uh, brand reputation and risk reputation. It was on food safety. And the presentation was a news article. All of it, of course, was fake. But we didn't know that. And it was delivered as breaking news. We had a, you know, a, a, some sort of a food contamination. X number of people are ill, passed away, and it scared the audience of thousands. I mean, we were like, oh, crap. And the discussion that followed was, this is all it takes. Speaking to your reputational risk of how important in that light food safety was. Now, you know, that was 20 plus years ago, so the cyber part wasn't yet, you know, centerpiece on the dining room table yet. Um, but that's critically important, obviously, is the brand reputation, because like a personal reputation, you know, it takes you years to build a good one in 30 seconds to uh, screw it up. And sure. it, at, your, at your scale, and you're globally responsible, right? You don't just that's have to, Yeah, you've got everything around the globe. How many... Um, it's what, 4,500 odd retail facilities in the U.S., but what is the scope? Give the audience a bit of scope on what your responsibility encounters. Yeah, if you think about the scope of our program, we really we really break it into three major areas. So, you know, one of which is security engineering. So that's managing our technology stack and, and the services that we provide um, to enable the business and to the enable the rest of tech. And that could be everything from, you know, identity and access management to um, encryption. Uh, it, it, there's dozens and dozens of services. Then, of course, we have a security operations area, um, which is actively working day and night to protect the organization from threats that may emerge from the external threat landscape. And then we have a, you know, a GRC function that um, it fulfills a governance role to make sure that we are doing the things that we say we're going to do and that we're being thoughtful and that we're working with the business um, and our global technology partners uh, to help to help avoid missteps um, along the way. Again, you know, and that's risk minimization. All of those at the end of the day, the technologies we deploy and support. Um, the security operations that actively protects the organization and, and of course, our governance remit, all of those in some way, they all tie back to risk mitigation. Um, of course, across those, there's dozens and dozens of teams that focus on very specific uh, areas of practice, but in a, you know, in a, in a top level view, that's kind of how our scope is structured. So you own... Um Procurement facilities, manufacturing all over the place, including retail, distribution, um, all of that around the globe, right? Everything that has Walmart attached to it, you own. Yeah, if, if there's a system where we're engaged in some way with it, sure. Unreal. Um, so let's move over into, you know, with that awesome responsibility, um, you have to be able to see around corners more than probably most in the business. So if you think about merchandising, their biggest challenge is what's going to be the cool toy this Christmas. And I'm not marginalizing that. I'm just for perspective conversation. If you're an asset protection and you have a responsibility for shrink, you're trying to figure out how to mitigate and keep a lid on it. Uh, even though at this point in time, it's a bit of a soup sandwich across retail. Um, how does how do you stay ahead in the technology battle? You think about we talked before the broadcast about Chat GPT and all the hysteria going on around that. But how does Jerry keep the world's biggest ahead of technological developments in securing that capital to spend? Because those of us that have been in retail, we've got tons of listeners in retail. It's always a capital fight. And in order to win the capital fight, you got to be able to prove and monetize the real risk and say, this will happen if we don't do X. And then you have to do a bit of a tap dance and convince people to get it. But you guys have done a phenomenal job. Uh, how do you, in that sense, 
monetize and quantify perceived and real risk to be able to stay ahead on the technology front? How do you do that? Uh, you know, I'll I'll start with first your question around you know capital uh, funding. It, you know, I'll tell you that we're we're very fortunate at Walmart in that um, this is a space that the company made a commitment to invest in well over two decades ago. Before certainly before I joined technology, right. um, there weren't a lot of companies talking about information security at that time. Um, and and those that were, you know, were probably in other sectors, financial sector, etc. Right. Um, so we've been fortunate in that it has long been recognized as a, a critical function um, here, and you know we've had we have support, have had, and continue to have support all the way to the the top of this organization. So we're careful when it comes to having conversations about funding that you know we we don't ever want to play the fear, uncertainty, and or doubt card. Um, you know, but we're very uh, we're very pragmatic in delivery of our assessment of risk, and um, and then we we prioritize. And one of the ways that we prioritize is we we've built a team around risk assessment. So we we assess risk a, a number of ways, but this particular team actually looks at risk from a quantitative viewpoint. And there's a lot of debate, especially amongst my industry peer group as to whether or not quantitative risk assessment is tenable or not. We have taken the position that it is tenable. And we're pretty happy with the practice that we've built around it. But essentially, there's a number of inputs that go into this. And, and one, of the, one of the underlying premises that we established when we started building this, this program was we shouldn't necessarily over-index on technologists or even security practitioners coming in to answer risk questions. We need risk experts. Um, so when we started building this team, we looked for people that had experiences, insurance actuaries, who are probably the best in the world at quantifying risk and likelihood of risk. Um, we brought in statisticians, mathematicians, people from different fields that would be additive to this capability. And, it, and over a number of years, we've built a capability to a pretty mature level that allows us to look at risk, whether they are, you know, regulatory risk or threat landscape risk or from wherever risk may come, and to uh, quantify those in a way that informs our decisions. And, and it informs our decisions uh, to allow us to uh, prioritize the work. What is going to reduce the most risk for the organization? And risk isn't necessarily always monetary. Risk can be measured in other things, brand reputation, as we talked about. Um, now, you may be able to tie that back to a monetary risk, but but we're looking at risk um, as it presents itself to a, a large enterprise. With that, that puts us in a position where and this is the debate that I've had with, with some of my peers in the industry around, around the models and the, the equations. And I said, you know, e even if the equations were wrong, we're measuring everything consistently. So mm -hmm. we can still rank order things and it still helps to in, in, inform um, our decisions. So when we do that, um, as you would expect, it's a very thorough and thought intensive process that takes feeds from, you know, all over our business, all over technology. We actually have a dedicated intelligence team um, in our security operations space uh, that, that curates the Thran landscape, landscape for us very well. Um, and of course, we are all actively engaged as students of our industry. So we watch how things are evolving, both in tech and in our, our area specifically. And we take all of those things and come together to decide what are the things that we need to go after. So it's always the, what do we continue doing? What isn't as important for whatever reason at this point that we can scale back on? And what are the new things that we need to do uh, in order to effectively protect the, the enterprise? Yeah, you know, uh, what stands out to me in, in your response there is you clearly in that space have a very distinct understanding of the difference between critical and important. 
So on the op side, um, the disciplines around understanding there is a difference. They are not synonyms. Um, you can either, uh, you know, and I, I can go ahead and use my analogy I often used to use. I said, look, we have a choice. And this came from my roots in the military, and I'm sure in the Marine Corps is very different. We were really good at understanding the difference between what critically had to get done and what was important and the difference between the two. And the priorities were clear. Um, but when I transitioned over to um, my civilian side, it was, you know, we have a choice. We can either do 100 things half-assed or we can do a handful of things really well. Uh, and, you know, there are other variants to that discussion, and it was always a struggle on the op side. And, I, and I'm speaking broadly from my collaboration with other retailers on the Horizons Committee at RELA and the conferences and all those 22 years, uh, 22 awesome years in retail, is that was a challenge, that being able to clearly state, you know what, that's important, but that ain't critical. And when I have $50 to hand out for the year, I'm not allocating to important. So my question, my follow-up question, Jerry, is, and if you can't answer it, brother, just, you know, you know me, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Just tell me, dude, I can't do that. Do you feel like that that distinction between critical and important permeates the rest of an organization, or is it pretty well pronounced just in the tech and in your specific silo? Yeah, I, I think it does permeate the, the large organization. And, he, and here's why. You know, Walmart's been on a transformation journey for a couple of years now, really focused around where is the consumer moving? How does the consumer want to be served? And we want to meet them where they want to be served. And um, in, in being part of the technology organization that unlocks meeting the customer where they where they want to be served really helps to keep the priorities in central focus. Um, I say it somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I tell my team all the time, we're here because our company sells toothpaste and tennis shoes at scale very efficiently. And when our business is no longer able to do that because of us, there's no reason for us to be here. So it always starts with the customer being centrally focused? And then what is it that we all need to do to move to support that customer? You know, and for our part within, within um, information security, that's helping to build secure operating environments in which our businesses can operate, in which the other global technology teams can operate, you know, in protecting the data that's been entrusted to us. Um, but we don't we don't start with we exist as information security for information security's sake. We exist because of that customer who comes to our cash register, or visits our websites, and we've got to always keep that centrally and focused. It, and it helps to drive that prioritiz prioritization um, of work, even outside of our our quantitative process that's looking solely at risk. Okay, now, you know, as you answered that, I'm looking at, uh, we're starting to get a few questions stacked up in the queue, but this one um, says, I think you just answered it. How do you approach the intersection of new ways delighting customers via tech and software enhancements, marketing, marketplace offerings in the ease of service, and cybersecurity? I think you just uh, answered that. Said, so is there a general filter you use? And I think your answer is, you know, focusing on the broader business and walking that back, not letting the tail wag the dog. Yeah, that's right. There's, I mean, there's very, there's very little in terms of innovation that would create value for the business that doesn't create some type of risk, but it's not a reason not to do it. You know, we want to innovate. We want to delight the customer to, to borrow that phrase. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes information security departments fall into the trap of becoming the department of no, in O, <laughs> as to, yeah. you know, yep. why you can't do something, why you shouldn't do something. That's the wrong mindset. You know, yeah. the security department really should be a partner to say, here's how we should do it. Here's some things to think about. Ultimately, risk decisions are business decisions. And, um, you know, it's our role to make sure that we make these decisions fully informed. 
Yeah, that and that that analogy goes across uh, spectrums. It was the same in the asset protection, you know, loss prevention division. You don't, you know, they used to call us, and everybody knows this that's listening, sales prevention, not loss prevention. And probably around, I don't know, the early 2000s, we started, you know, growing a little bit in perspective and came to the business table to say, okay, we will support whatever you want to do, but here are some inherent risks that we can monetize or that we see could be a problem later. Didn't mean we won every battle. Uh, Sometimes, you know, the train had already left the station, as they say, and we had to play catch up and do the postmortem. Um, let me go to this next uh, question here. Um, I see training on a tactical level for cybersecurity, but limited training at the leadership level. What advice would you give to the leaders who have been successful in other areas of the business and now want to broaden their experience into cyber? So saying a director at Walmart in merchandising does what Jerry did 20 years ago and says, hey, I think I have an aptitude for tech. How do you do that? Yeah, um, I think the first thing you've got to do is share that you have an interest in making that that change. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I have um, two, maybe three people in my area now who started their career in Walmart as pharmacists. Completely oh. different yeah. job field. Yep. Um, they wanted a change at some point. As we were talking earlier about, you know, how do you grow the workforce that you need? So you're you're likely aware Walmart has a program called Live Better University, where we actually fully fund our associates going and pursuing um, bachelor's degrees with well-known universities um, in in a number of fields. Well, when that program was being built. We pointed out the shortage of talent in cybersecurity and said this would be a great uh, area for us to offer degrees in. And we do. Um, And uh, we've had a number of associates that have come into cybersecurity uh, through that program, Um, three of which actually started their careers as pharmacists um, with our company. And I can't think of, you know, two areas that might be more different. Um, you know, so, so they wanted to make the change. They pursued, uh, educating themselves to make themselves a a competitive candidate. Now that's not to say everybody that comes in has to go that path. Um, it's, uh, there's any number of paths that, that you can take, but I think the first thing to do would be to raise your hands and have a conversation with somebody to say, you know, I'm actually interested in steering my career into that industry. How do I do that? Um, You know, because the the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand about information security is people outside of security tend to think of security as one thing. Um, But security is dozens and dozens of different areas of practice, some more technical, some less technical. Um, And there's likely an area that would, you know, be available for somebody that wants to move their career in in that type of uh, direction, uh, regardless of, of, uh, what their background is. Yeah. I think that's, you know, professionally healthy. I know years and years and years ago, and I think you already alluded to it, you know, that certain divisions or certain disciplines tend to have a, a, a bring them in young and grow them through the chain instead of getting exterior talent. And I don't know what, at what point, uh, in our past, that bringing over store operations, bringing over merchants, bringing over, like you said, pharmacists, just people that would make uh, somebody say, Jerry, do you really know what you're doing in recruiting? These guys don't know squat about tech. And my fir- my earliest experience was that was it was still the late 90s and we were building out the team in loss prevention for merchandise protection and you know trying to get our legs around that stuff. And I'd done, I'd gone through an interview panel and I thought I had made the right decision. And right before I was ready to send out the offer, uh, recruiting called said, Hey, hang on a minute. You need to interview this guy. And I'm like, come on, you know, I've already done this. And so reluctantly I interviewed him and it blew me out of the water and it was an auditor. And I was mainly focused on those that were in our division. They knew the business, et cetera. And clearly this guy was fresh thought. 
brought him in and he, and he was a rock star. I'm not going to mention his name because I think he's still, still at Walmart, but that was the first time. And leadership looked at me like, okay, dude, you came out of the army. You haven't been here long enough to cut your teeth. You don't know what you're doing. I didn't run up against that. I had a very supportive uh, boss at the time. He's like, all right, dude, you really think this is the guy? And it was phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, yeah good. Um, can you talk about, and I'm going to butcher the name, Spark event you held? We saw that on LinkedIn, so I'm assuming you can talk about it. Does that yeah, sure. Really yeah, so that's, that's SparkCon, and it actually is, uh, I appreciate the chance to do a plug. Uh, it's actually April 15th, so we it hasn't occurred yet this year. Okay. It's, it's uh, next Saturday, okay. April 15th. Uh, essentially what SparkCon is, is it is a security-focused conference that Walmart uh, organizes and hosts. We put together a lineup of speakers that speak about, obviously, information security, cybersecurity topics. Um, some of those are internal to our own teams, and we bring in um, speakers externally as well to speak. It, it really is, it, it serves a couple of purposes for us. Um, the first of which is it's open to the public. Um, it's free. And um, it allows us to actually give back to the industry. We know that um, you know there are a lot of companies and organizations of all sizes, of all budgets, and security conferences can be expensive, and travel can be expensive. You know, we're located here with this conference in the Midwest, uh, so we're we're driving distance for a lot of major metro areas, um, and we're not charging for it. So you know, we're all um, stakeholders in the broader cybersecurity industry. Um, you know, and we want to help lift all organizations to be more secure and to reduce their risk. Um, so by offering this conference, it's just one of the ways that that we're trying to give back to the industry um, and to the community. So, yeah, that's coming up um, actually next Saturday. I think this will be our third one, I believe. We weren't able to do it for the last couple of years, obviously, because of the pandemic. Uh, but this is our first one back since then. So we're pretty excited about that. Awesome. Well, I timed that right. I thought it had already been held. Um, so let's talk about collaboration. You mentioned that. Um, one of the things we enjoy, and most of our listeners know this if they're in the asset protection arena, it's not a competitive industry. Crooks are crooks. We all face the same threats, and we often collaborate on 95% of what we do. Um, do you find that information sharing, you do a lot of dark stuff, um, with your, you know, dark web that I learned about, you know, with my engagements with the University of Alabama, I'd never heard of that before. And I'm like, oh, um, so can you talk a little bit about how major retailers collaborate to do exactly what you just mentioned is, you know, be a force multiplier instead of everybody fighting the same cat individually? Sure. Um, yeah, there's a, actually quite a bit of intelligence sharing that occurs uh, across the cybersecurity industry, and there's a number of different ways that you can get that. Of course, there's um, you know there's paid subscriptions for intelligence feeds. There's um, there's list serves, if you will, um, where people from multiple organizations will come together to share intelligence, um, and then there's formal organizations like the Retail and Hospitality ISAC. Um, where where the members will often uh, collaborate and, and share information uh, to and to your point it's it's it serves us all well um, it you know it's not an area where we look to gain competitive advantage um, you know someone uh, a threat actor for example isn't brand loyal um, you know that they, they're gonna come after everybody yeah. Um, and very often it's just targets of opportunity and there's, you know, the internet is vast and you mentioned the dark web and, you know, so that where you can identify that an organization may have an issue or maybe, maybe they don't have an issue. Maybe they're just being targeted or someone's asking about, Hey, how would I go after this organization? The likelihood of somebody from that organization seeing that depending on what capabilities they have, you know, might be fairly low. Um, but if we are all talking and we're all watching out for each other, um, you know, then we're sharing that information of saying, hey, you know, we saw your name mentioned in this dark web post. You just want to make sure you're aware of it. 
Um, and in doing that, again, it kind of raises raises all organizations because ultimately what we want to do is we want to increase the cost to operate for threat actors. Um, and if we're sharing information um, in, in helping other organizations to identify, um, you know, a tax surface that they can they can maybe better address or more effectively manage or at least be aware of, um, then that that really that helps everybody. Yeah, you know, the, the years that <clears throat> at Walmart, we did that with Rila, and it was always refreshing to work with the other retailers, the big players, Kroger, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walgreens, CVS, Best Buy. And uh, it was always a collaborative effort. Um, it was never, you know, oh, so we're going to do this, but we're not going to tell other retailers about it. I never ran across that until much later in my career. And it was a nuanced situation. Oh, yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, we don't necessarily limit it to retailers. Um, you know, we we work across multiple verticals and sectors um, um, because ultimately, ultimately, at the bad, at the end of the day, the bad guy wants to go after assets that they can potentially monetize, and those types of things certainly aren't exclusive to retailers. So, you know, they they may go after any number of sectors or verticals. Uh, so, the more that we're talking cross sector cross verticals um, across different industries uh, again it just it helps everyone so let's let's um, visit on um, recruiting if you were on campus not that I'm partial but at the University of Alabama for example um, what would you tell graduates that are roadblocks to coming into cyber? as a career field? And what are the imperatives that would uh, preclude me from doing that if I missed it? What do I really need to do to be competitive in that space as a college student? Yeah, you know what I would I would say is that there's not there's not necessarily a single path to move from the college experience in into cybersecurity there's there's so a number of paths that someone could pursue but what i would suggest to someone that wants to move into the field is to find an area that you really enjoy something you find interesting mm -hmm. something that you can be passionate about and start to develop a subject matter expertise in a space um you know and maybe that is uh being a developer so you're getting a computer science degree um, so if you're getting a computer science degree, but you want to go into cybersecurity, there's a couple of different angles you could play on that. You could you could actually go and become an expert or start to develop an expertise in securely writing code, um, you know, and, and, and trying to help uh, address an organization address, you know, common code errors that uh, the developers may make. Um, you may. Uh, you may leverage that skill set to go work in a security operations center, you know, and and write detections in Python, which is probably you know the, one of the hot areas right now. Um, you you may have an interest in file system forensics. You may have an interest in cryptography. Um, there's so many different areas that you can go into in cybersecurity, and I often tell people there's very very few people that will be an expert in everything in cybersecurity. Um, there's just too much to know. So we all at some point in our careers have to decide what our, our left and right lateral limits are and then go deep into that space. Now, that's not to say you can't change it at some point in the future. If you find another area that you're interested in, if you've already demonstrated the aptitude to deeply learn one area of technology, you're likely going to be successful in deeply learning another area. Um, but what I would tell them is pick something you really want to focus on. Um, organizations have needs uh, for expertise in a number of cybersecurity disciplines. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing you said, you know, as you know, and some of the listeners do, I go down to the University of Alabama every semester I'm going next week, and I speak to the careers class of the criminal justice students, so it'll be 150-odd students, all with the same questions. And what I've always told them, I said, look, you know, if you want to use me as an example, I am the role model of accidental success. Nothing in my life was a plan. I went into the Army because my family couldn't afford college and I needed to compete for the ROTC scholarship. I wound up on active duty, did fairly well there, got the MBA, got out, came to retail. I didn't know the difference between cost and retail. I knew nothing. And... Um, 
So, you know, and just one successful uh, engagement after another, and it's been awesome. Are there, in your mind, Jerry, are there future critical intersections between physical and cybersecurity? Oh, That's yeah. It, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there's absolutely intersections between what my my peers and partners do in the more traditional security venues um, and ours. And we often collaborate, obviously, we'll get into specifics, but we often collaborate on, on mutual interests. And again, it always comes back to the same thing, reduction of risk, wherever those risks may present themselves. Yeah, the the other uh, couple of points, and we're <clears throat> we have about fifteen minutes left. Um, is there an audible question, Matt, or is that feedback coming from somewhere? I keep hearing a voice in the background, or maybe that's just in my head. Okay, I think we're all right. Um, so let's talk about. We talked a little bit about ROI and how you position risk and monetize perceived risk that some people have no appreciation for, but trust the guy at the table to say we have a problem. In your mind, um, and there are inherent risks to third-party solutions. Everybody in retail gets that. You, you necessarily expose yourself to a degree, whether it's tolerable, tolerable or not. Um, are there certain channels of your space, that third party is a preference or is it the preference is always to try and do it internally? Kind of how do you see that from a business perspective, not just yeah. some but total business? Yeah, sure. I, I wouldn't say there's a preference. Um, you know, we're always going to try to bring in the solution that best serves the enterprise in whatever way we need to serve the enterprise. And sometimes that is uh, developing a solution internally. And that may be because we haven't found a solution that fully meets our needs or doesn't really address the use case that we're trying to, to solve for. And there are other times where, you know, a, a third party solution is ready to go. And, um, and in order to deliver a capability or a service quickly, um, we're going to bring in that third party solution. What what often drives those decisions are really a couple of factors that come into play most prevalently. Um, and the first is if we can build it internally to meet the use cases, then we actually own the life cycle of that product. And we tend to get more longevity out of it. Um, but we've got to have the knowledge and the expertise to go down that path. If it's an area that might be new to us, I'll go back 15 years when we brought in our first security operations center. We didn't, we had never run a security operations center. It really no one had. We were somewhat ahead of the curve in in and not everybody brings in security operations centers. A lot of people use managed services these days, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, but at the time we decided. You know, we wanted to do this internally. Well, we didn't have the expertise to do it. So we went out and found a company to partner with. And they came in and they built it for us. And then over time, we built that muscle, if you will, and um, and took over more and more of those operations to where now we, you know, we, we have a deep expertise in running that type of operation internally. But we didn't at one point in time. So we went and found a partner that did. And that helped us move in the direction we wanted to move more quickly. The other thing that we always have to look at is is scale, and um, that's probably our first question that we ask when we're talking to somebody about a third party solution: is what's your largest deployment, and and have you operated at the scale that uh, it is Walmart? Um, because the last thing we want to do is go out, bring out, bring in a solution, and then find that it just won't work at our scale, or it won't work the way that we would want it to um, at our scale. And, and it, it, because if you make that misstep, you've kind of created tech debt. Um, and tech debt has to be managed and it, it pulls you away from your core mission as to why you're there because then you're managing tech debt. Same thing if, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at third party solutions, we have to make the decision of, okay, does this meet all of our needs? If it doesn't, at what percentage of needs does it meet? And, and is that acceptable? Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to bring in a third party solution. 
and then customize it to the extent that over time, um, your vendor can no longer support it because it looks completely different than the product that they sold you. Yeah. Um, and when you get to a point where, hey, we rely heavily on this product, but we've done so much customization that the vendor can't support it anymore. Well, then you have, again, you've created tech debt that you've got to you've got to manage. So you want to try and avoid those scenarios when it comes to third party software. But there's not a right or wrong answer. Um, there's just different reasons that you would make the decision to to do it internally or or to bring in a third party, and that's typically kind of where we land on those decisions. Yeah, I mean, you know, in fairness, and those same conversations used to come up when I was there is, you know, what have you done on our scale? You know, in all fairness, um, <laughs> unless they've done business with the Pentagon, they probably have never engaged in anything the scale that you guys do. Um, and being able to step up and, and accommodate that efficiently and understanding that it's an unforgiving space. And I'm, I'm more broadly speaking to those that may have an interest in engaging um, for, for necessary reasons. Um, you can't stumble uh, more than once. It's a rather unforgivable space. It's like nuclear operations in the military. That's unforgivable. You don't have missteps doing that. If you do, you pretty much know it's over. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, a broader interpretation of risk mitigation and automation in the stores. And I know you and I had a pre-conversation about that, but I'm more interested in Jerry as the customer now, not the CISO. Um, <clears throat> do, you, do you think in retail broadly that there is a risk to over-automating the customer experience? It's an interesting question. I don't know that I'm necessarily the right person to to answer that i i think it likely goes back to you know what i mentioned earlier is it's really important that we all understand how the customer wants to be served and where they want to be served and that we we meet them there and of course customers desires probably span the entire continuum right some very much want the traditional retail experience while you know others want to fully leverage every piece of technology that we could provide yeah. and we don't want to alienate any of those customers so i think it it's less about auto, automation for the customer but more about uh, are you delivering the breadth of experience that's going to meet all of your customers in a way that they want to be served, whether that's walking into a store or whether that's using our apps um, uh, to buy online or to do grocery pickup or grocery delivery or whatever it may be. Um, you know, and those all require different technology stacks and a different uh, type of engagement with technology, depending on what you choose. Um, and we don't ever want, we would never want a customer to feel like, well, I'm not going to go to Walmart anymore because, you know, I don't, I don't like the way they do this or the way they do that. You know, we want to give them options uh, to be served however they're most comfortable with. And that's, that's the answer, dude. I couldn't page you to have come up with a better, more effective answer. It, it, you know, we had this discussion in Germany. I was over there last month for Euroshop, ran into Mark Ibbotson. Mark was presenting uh, on stage and had a few minutes with him after the conversation. But I asked the one question. I was in the audience and I asked the one question. I asked exactly that. And you know Mark's pedigree. He came from Marks and Spencer. He's a retail operator. Right. Um, and he's still active in the space in a different capacity. Uh, but he, he very much aligned with your answer. It, the, the, the risk is, yes, if you go ditch to ditch, so you go from a standard man checkout lane to 100% self-checkout. Well, there's going to be an element of customer that's like, no, thanks. I'm not doing this. So you really pigeonhole yourself if you're in the risk bucket of Amazon Go or iFi or some of the cashierless stores. But is it truly a risk? Because you know what you're going into. You walk into an Amazon Go store knowing what the engagement's going to be. So the successful retailers, and I am supporting your answer, Mark had very much the same. He said the, the balancing act is understanding number one and most critically. Who is your customer? And that should not come from a McKinsey survey or some consultant you paid $5 million to to go out and do market studies. Instinctively, what Mark said on stage was, if you don't know the answer to that question, then you're probably not the guy to make the decision on the tech. 
if you don't understand that customer and it's a balancing act of, you know, let's get into current state. So you have a balance of self-checkout and man lanes. You have a balance of, you know, if you want to uh, do a, a scan and go or, you know, buy online and pick up in store e-commerce, whatever those variants are. And from that, you begin to further refine who your customer is because you're looking at the data usage data. So the mistake a retailer can make is going from man lanes with two self-checkouts to overnight remodel. Now we're 99% self-checkout and we have to have one register because somebody's going to write a check. Um, good. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to call it for open mic questions. Let me look and see. We got one in chat. Uh, did I, did, oh, that's Matt. Okay. Um, so we'll go to, and I know how you answered this, but I think it's worthy of, of uh, mic time. Is the anonymity afforded through technology? And let me let me rephrase the question better verbally than I probably did on email. Is anonymity is something that on social media today you can very effectively hide behind? I don't have to. Nobody's going to check and see if Brand Overston is actually the owner of that Twitter account or whatever social media platform you're on. So, but I'm at least a reasonable person is far more careful when the real brand Overston opens that account in, in, in the correspondence you have in the posts, et cetera. Um, when you go into a store, and the reason I'm mentioning that is I've had uh, quite a few engagements, most of them were in Germany uh, last month, of in order to have an effective theft deterrent um, malicious intent blanket, if you will, or defense mechanism in retail, they want to erase. Uniformly, most of the solutions had some degree they wanted to erase the anonymity that a normal thief has. Nobody knows who the crackhead is that comes in with a ski mask, you know, and a hoodie, and you don't know who they are. But in order to gain access to a showcase, for example, you scan a QR code and you got to put in your phone number. Well, my question to them was, why in the hell do I have to put in my, what are you doing with that phone number? As an honest customer, I'm thinking, great, I'm going to get a text. I'm going to get tons of advertisements. I'm going to get all kinds of junk I don't want. I just want the product. Do you see, again, as a customer, not in the cyberspace, um, as our last question, that the anonymity plays a decisive role from the customer perspective? Or is that something now that's so ubiquitous, we really don't care? Yeah, again, I, I don't know that I'm the right person to necessarily pontificate on this. So I'll just answer it as, you know, a, a consumer. I, yeah. I think what is probably, from my view, what would be most important is transparency. So if you're prompting me to scan a QR code and you want me to enter data, I really want to understand how you're going to use that. Uh, to your point, um, you know, and we talk a lot. Uh, I have a partner. In, in our digital citizenship group, uh, Nula O'Connor, brilliant in her space. And her and I talk a lot about, you know, the ethical use of data yeah. um, and how important it is, you know, a, a, as a retailer that we're transparent with the customers as to, you know, how we would use data that they choose to entrust us with. So if I'm walking into a shop for the first time and I have to scan a QR code and enter a lot of information, for me personally, that's going to cause me hesitation. Me too. For my kids, yeah. they'd probably give them everything they asked for and volunteer additional. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, to some extent, maybe it follows, you know, generational differences, um, you know, because I'm regularly having to talk to my kids about don't overshare online. Um, they don't seem as concerned with it as, you know, I might be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. My wife, I mean, we're both boomers. People can, that know me know that. And she even, you know, shreds uh, snail mail that comes in that has our address on it, even the little barcodes that go across the bottom. I'm like, honey, you do know you can pretty much go to Google and search the name and our address is everywhere. You're not hiding anything. Um, but, yeah, to your point, yes, I think it does have a generational component to it and the propensity for younger generations maybe to overshare. Um but the anonymity in the risk mitigation space, conventional malicious intent does play a role, whether you're an academic 
uh, or an operator, we know that when you lose anonymity, it does give the retailer a bit of an edge in being able to mitigate that theft instance. If I know that you're Jerry Geisler or Brand Elverston or what your phone number might be or your cell phone pinged off my um, uh, network in the store and that you know maybe we have an IP or something of that nature. Thank you.